recognize having this very conversation is mm-hmm. seen as a taboo. Education is elevation. The purpose of this video is to not only expose the way in which white supremacy loves to deploy tactics of divide and conquer against different minorities. We also gonna get into how anti-blackness becomes a way for mobility for individuals, foster relationships amongst communities and not cause division amongst them. Um, UEP Newton once said that power is the ability to define the phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. And the phenomenon we're gonna be getting into today is how there are so many immigrant owned businesses in the black community and how a lot of people are indoctrinated to believe in that you can take advantage of black people in order to experience upper mobility, including black people. Research over me search, education is elevation. Today's conversation is gonna take a lot of intellectual maturity. We're gonna have a crucial conversation about power, domination in the black community and how black people become what Frank, Dr. Frank Wooderson calls the junior partners of civil society. When it comes to systems of capitalism or systems of anti-blackness, black people are seen as a fair for all game for everybody to be able to explore by impoverished positions to be able to build profit off our backs. Everybody views being able to take advantage of black people's poor positions to be able to build, you feel me? And that's just kind of a truism within America, even when it comes to black people. Even black people believe that we should be able to take advantage of poor black people the way we want to, the way we feel. And that's when we start getting into this question of how there are so many immigrant-owned businesses in the black community. If you want to be more specific, one could ask why there are so many Asian-owned businesses inside the black community. Throughout this video, I plan to sprinkle a little bit of nuance, not only in terms of policy, but also in terms of historical events and also in terms of human relations and how ideology start to get into how systems operate. This video was inspired by a TikToker by the name of Circus Ferry. Shout out to Circus Ferry. They're the ones that did. Asian American businesses have been operating in black communities for 60 years. I'll say it again. The Civil Rights Act passed in 1964, and the United States opened the door to Asian immigration in 1965 to put immigrants in the way of black people. And this idea that the tension between business owners and customers is one of mutual cultural misunderstanding that could be overcome if they just got to know each other better, the time for that has long past. And as I've said before, the problem with framing the misunderstanding as mutual is where one demographic owns the businesses and the other demographic has to pay, there's no mutuality. There is a power imbalance. The only situation that I could see being beneficial at this point would require Asian Americans to be willing to leverage their ability to secure the business loans to secure supplier accounts and to attain business licenses, to open in black communities specifically to hire black people to work in the businesses and to provide the professional development opportunities so that black people can become the leadership in the businesses in their communities. But I don't have a lot of hope that Asian Americans are willing to do that because the Asian American business owners that we see currently are not even willing to treat their black customers as human. So I fully support black people boycotting these problematic businesses in their community. And I want to say that I think another thing that non-black people aren't aware of is that it is not as simple as boycotting the businesses and putting them out of business and then opening your own to compete because the system will find ways to still not give them the loans or rezone them so they can't open a business or not grant the business licenses. And suppliers are literally conspiring against black people who have managed to open a business in their own community to not supply to them because they don't want black people competing with the Asian American owned businesses in the community. So I wish that I had more to offer in the way of solutions, but I really don't. But please do not gaslight black people with respect to what the issue is. At least we can recognize that a lot of us think that we can hustle our way out of white supremacy or that we can just simply buy back the block 
And a lot of those methodologies are absence of how policy plays into how resources are distributed in our community and also ignores how policy gives access to our communities. What we can acknowledge, and when she was speaking, is that in 1964, there was a Civil Rights Act that was passed, and in 1965, there was an Immigration Act that passed. We recognize that these two policies had a determining factor in how the Black community operates to this day. What I know is that when it comes to different restaurants, different nail salons, different beauty stores, that these, these businesses are usually owned by non-Black people, however, operated within the Black community. With the Civil Rights Amendment passing in 1964, and then immigration opening up in 1965, and recognizing this pattern of using immigrants to um, basically get in the way of accountability to Black people. So it's like, okay, the Civil Rights Amendment finally passes. There should be some accountability. Systems should be changing. And then all of a sudden you've thrown a group of people into the mix who, who don't have context. <laughs> like they've just arrived. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my mom and my dad, my mom arrived in the 50s, but my dad arrived in the 60s. Those, those opportunities, right? Like those educational opportunities, those business opportunities, those resources um, that with the Civil Rights Amendment should have been opportunities for Black people who fought for those civil rights are now, um, you know, and I hesitate to say this because I don't want to say that Asian Americans don't work hard and that they don't deserve what they get, but, you know, they, they arrive and that opportunity is being given to them. And we even know that with the Civil Rights Amendment passing in 1964, that doesn't mean like, oh, everything, that doesn't mean that there's no more discrimination, that, you know, 1964, that's shut the door on discrimination. An amendment passes and you still have all these states with legislation. And, and we know that systems still haven't changed. So I think something that had really brought me into your video is the historical and the policy analysis about the issue. Usually mm -hmm. we are talking about how there are a lot of non-black owned businesses in the black community. I think yeah. it's done through a way where we kind of perpetuate pathology. So what mm -hmm. I like about your nuance in your video is that you say something important like, hey, it's not just cultural differences. Right. Like one people own and one people buy, that's not balanced. So, yeah. <laughs> so when I was learning more about it, I was reading a paper that described it as mutual understanding or misunderstanding, mutual misunderstanding. Like after the LA riots, they would interview um, Asian, you know, there would be um, business owners who would say like, oh, well, we, we didn't know about the civil rights struggle. So if we had known, we would have been more sympathetic to the community. At that point, I feel like, okay, but it's been like 20, over 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, and, and I just, and I was like, but, but again, there's no, there's no mutuality. Because there's a dynamic, again, where it's the business owners versus customers. And it's business owners in the neighborhood of the customers. So that's a power dynamic. And I think something that I wish I didn't feel as cynical about um, is it's, it's been so long that I feel like if these, if these businesses wanted to do better, they could have done better by now. Um, so I kind of, like, I... At this point, I support like at this point, I support boycotts, I support boycotts. I get called a traitor for that because they're saying like, you know, you're you're advocating for people to not support Asian American businesses. And I'm like, but if they're going to engage in predatory capitalism and if they're, um, you know, not going to do right by the communities that they're in, then what else do you do? Like, there's no more explaining. I'm doing a little research on motto, research over research, research over research. I got this from the journal was called The Misinterpretations and Injustices, the 1992 Los Angeles Riots and Black and Korean Conflict by King Kok Chun. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I apologize if I'm not. It says, there are several problems associated with such reasoning. First, most recent Asian immigrants have brought with them considerable economic and cultural capital. Unlike African Americans who had suffered centuries of slavery and uh, attended poverty and illiteracy. Second, just because Asian Americans have not sought welfare or medical aid from the government does not mean they have not need for such help. The simple lack of the wherewithal, such as a fluency in the English and knowledge about the U.S. social system to seek it. Third, the myth of the model minority homogenized all Asian Americans when many Chinese Americans 
Filipino Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Cambodian Americans still live below the poverty level. What we see here is that there's a concerted effort of anti-blackness and how light over dark, white over black becomes a structural modality that allows for different people to value different individuals and create this hierarchy. What we understand is that even given this hierarchy, I can acknowledge as a black person, there has been a lot of people and a lot of sentiments in our community that have internalized this idea of the myth of the model minority. And what we know from doing different interviews and talking to different people in the Asian community and the black community, that this myth of the minority is one that is asserted, that is able to almost sustain, legitimize the idea of divide and conquer. But I'm saying that I understand why like nervous trolls are like, oh, you're blaming white supremacy and there's not even any white people involved. Like, I mean, like there are no white people. <laughs> That's the masterfulness of white supremacy, man. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I can be present without being present, that's like, if you can acknowledge that whiteness and white supremacy operates by being, like, always being present without being present, it's kind of how it is. We can think about how it assists the communities of Black people, mm -hmm. aesthetics and, and, and ethics and morals of white supremacy, it creep yeah. into it. It's the reason why this work is so hard. That's the reason why we can acknowledge that even in places because you know what we can do? We can center blackness. We're gonna center whiteness. We're gonna center anti-blackness. We can acknowledge mm -hmm. that seven continents in the world, mm -hmm. everyone continents are implicated in the systems of anti-blackness. So right. we start thinking about the root cause of anti-blackness, we can acknowledge it's something about blackness and black people that the world views as being consumable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And views as being something you can always separate black folks from what they create. Right. And it's just like, hey, I'm sorry, uh, racist. Or you know what? I'm sorry, well-meaning white person, a well-meaning person of color that believes that anybody can be racist and they believe we all should be singing Kumbaya. Right. <laughs> the reason why we beefing is not because we both put our pants on the same. The reason why we have conflict is not because we both bleed red. If the reason why we can't see out of how we got beef is not because we both are part of the human race. It's because of these differences in the way in which we have bought into stories. So now I think it's important that People like you, people mm -hmm. like me, tell our story in a way where we purposely and intentionally leaning in to how do you and I mm -hmm. understand each other better while yes. working through the shit that makes it where we don't understand each other. When it comes to thinking about how conflict operates within the community, especially this conflict of, of Asian Black, Korean Black, is that a lot of us took on the gaze of white supremacy or anti-Blackness, meaning a lot of people in the Asian community only view black people through the lens and eyes of white supremacy. Where you take on these different ideas of black, or, or where you internalize different ideas of black folks being criminal, irrational, you feel me? Thieves, thugs, all that. You see what I'm saying? I also was able to acknowledge how black people internalize the white gaze in ways where we only view Asian Americans and Asian people through the lens of white supremacy. These are the hardworking, exotic, great in math, great in science, uh, 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 can focus, um, very passive, uh, 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 all feminized bodies, you know what I'm saying? This is what I think is important about how we build more meaningful conversations and relationships between the Black and Asian community. And being able to define the phenomenon and make it act in desired ways, how the United States federal government, as well as the banks, as well as uh, different people in L.A., Houston, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Atlanta, all across the country, interplay in how we have usually, you know, some Pakistan, Iran, um, uh, Korean, uh, Chinese, you feel me, individuals that own a particular business in the Black community, and they have taken on these different views of how we see them. What I also want to make clear is, Though I can acknowledge, because I know it's about to some nuance, I can acknowledge that there is a power imbalance with the Black community and the Asian community and how it relates to each other, while also acknowledging how both parties are implicated in each other's structural oppression and or implicated in how bad things happen to us. You see what I'm saying? We all know that during the 2020, Black people became almost the faces in some instances of Asian hate. 
biggest thing that I wish, again, it goes to the root cause harm in white supremacy. And something that I've always felt as an Asian American is if we understand how inaccurate stereotypes are about us and how we get portrayed in media and how we get talked about in media and in politics, we have to be able to understand that it's the same for other groups. Like that is like, if we recognize what's, what's being told that's inaccurate about us, then why are we not able to recognize that what's being said about black people is inaccurate or for all people of color? Like, yeah. and I think that goes to what you're saying is that we're all like, we're all indoctrinated to view one another through a white supremacist lens. So I think that's, that's what I want Asian Americans to recognize. We know, you know, if we know how it hurts us, then we should be able to recognize how it hurts others. Internalized xenophobia. I would say that when it comes to a lot of the ways that Black people are able to rationalize with white supremacist views of Asian people, Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, is a lot of internalized xenophobia and a lot of internalized uh, Orientalism. We even call it internalized. You just they bought into it. That's why I would call it internalized. And this is coming from King Kong Chong. But they say that the exemplary Asians often were evoked in contrast to African Americans, thereby pitting the two groups against each other. Nadia Kim points out that many Korean immigrants were prone to accept and reproduce these presidential notions by interpreting their model minority position above Blacks and Latinos as proof that they were to try hard enough they can overcome their forms of racial discrimination. The reality turned out otherwise. In case for the South Central Los Angeles, Korean immigrants readily inherited these stereotypes ascribed to their Jewish predecessors who sought images of unscrupulous sh uh, uh, shopkeepers and chronically overcharged his dates back to Shakespeare. However, unlike Jewish merchants before them, many Korean merchants were non-Anglophone speakers and were therefore seen additionally as foreigners. Hence, what I think perpetuating the idea or allow individuals to buy more into xenophobia, the discrimination against other people that speak different languages and or come from different countries. We see this as the image of Korean Americans as outsiders and black people going to their soul as customers. Well, we know what the young, I'm saying what the woman said, Circus Ferry said that these, these conflicts that I'm talking about right now cannot just be simply explained away and being just mutual differences. To repeat the words, when one community is the owners and the other community is the buyers, we have a power imbalance. And I know I've seen Dr. Ball of Morgan State's analysis and being able to talk about the power in consumption. We can acknowledge the power of consumption while also acknowledging that the power of ownership will always trump the power of consumption, i.e. saying that it doesn't matter how much you consume if what you're consuming is not owned, produced, or manufactured by you. You see what I'm saying? And this is when we start getting into the specifics of the weed business, the specifics of the nail business, and ideally recognizing that these two are multi-billion dollar industries that are fueled by the black dollar, which means that we consume and high. We can acknowledge that when we see, or when we can, when, when, when we identify the weed business or the hair business, nail business being a billion dollar industry recognize that black people are not the beneficiaries of that. So we ask the question again, how so many Asian owned companies or businesses are in the black community. And that's when we start to get in to policy. We're gonna get into policy by talking about the weed business specifically. Though we know Dr. Rita talked about her parents being in the liquor business. What we know is that big business was doing so well, especially amongst African-American consumers, that the Korean wig merchants pushed the corner of the market. In 1965, the Korean wig merchants joined together and convinced the Korean government to outlaw the export of raw hair, said Ann Raman, a filmmaker who was documented in the marginalization of African-American entrepreneurs in the hair care industry in the film. What they say is that that this ban made it so that they can only buy pre-made wigs and extensions. In other words, Korean hair can only be manufactured in Korea. Six months later, the United States government created a ban on any wig that contains hair from China, effectively putting a South Korean in prime position to exploit the market and effectively create a monopoly. So when we think about the various of black women or black people that have talked about trying to open up stores in the black hair industry, 
and being locked out by vendors, just like Circus Fairy pointed out in her video, we see that even when black people are able to create their own businesses in this industry, the system has its ways of locking them out and or pushing them on the margins. What we know is that according to Ryan, there are only four central distributors serving beauty supply stores in this country. We know that these Korean owned distributors discriminate against black owners in order to maintain their monopoly in the market. Ronan interviewed Lucky White, the owner of Kazar Ironworks, which specializes in making styling tools like curling irons in the, in, in for his 2006 film, a documentary. It was new to me to learn, but I'm not surprised, but it was new to me to learn that, of course, when a black person tries to get into the hair business, then they find that suppliers won't let them have accounts because they don't want competition um with the asian owned businesses and this is something that i wanted to look more into this was just something that i got from a commenter though they were saying that they've had luck um going with indian suppliers mm, see. if somebody's looking to own a business according to ron there are only four central distributors serving beauty supply stores in the country and that these korean owned distributors discriminate against black store owners in order to maintain their monopoly in the market. Ronan interviewed Lucky White, the owner of Kazur Iron Works, which specializes making styling tools like curling irons for this documentary, for a 2006 documentary. Miss White claimed that distributors told her that her products were no longer in demand as an excuse to turn away her products in favor of knockoffs produced by Asian companies. But Robert Cleary, a former director of the Dash and Diva Nail Salon Franchising Corporation said that although he did witness discrimination in the Korean dominated nail salon businesses, he doesn't believe that the discrimination on a business level is exclusively race based. Here's what he said. The Korean, the central Korean distributors actively work to create barriers of, of entry to any group, even other Koreans to protect the status quo, he said. The Koreans use the nail in hair industry to get a foothold in this country. They were doing something as many as immigrants do and that people who lived in their country wanted to do so and didn't have interest in doing it. I'm going to read that part again. He said that the Koreans used the nail and hair industry to get a foothold in this country. They were doing something as many immigrants do that the people who lived in this country did not want to do or didn't have any interest in. They found the need and found a niche they made from their own concentration that these businesses promoted a shrewd of secrecy and protectiveness that became hard to penetrate. The article goes on to talk about how um, using of illegal labor, using of uh, various practices is kind of something that was able to keep the business practices in secrecy. What we also acknowledge is, what I also acknowledge, what came on me consciously as I read that, is that the idea that most immigrants come to this country and pick up jobs that most Americans don't is one that one can say is true. But when we start thinking about it specifically, when we think about like unemployment rates for black people or think about how black people have been excluded from different professions, this idea that immigrants are taking up jobs that black people don't want, it is one that kind of falls on deaf ears or it is one that is unaccountable or unresponsive to the reality that we live in. When I was doing the research on this particular video right here, I uh, decided to use ChatGPT for the first time. And what I asked ChatGPT about the 1990, uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Immigration Act, how they related to each other. And what the ChatGPT kept on talking about is basically getting at how black people don't have the business acumen, but did not have the business acumen to be able to run a business. And you can see how not only has artificial intelligence, but a lot of immigrants that come over to come over to America, they assimilate into American values. And a lot of those American values is anti-blackness and white supremacy or internalized inferior notions of black people. We can acknowledge that both of these groups have been discriminated against. Both mm -hmm. of these groups have been legally persecuted. Why is it that one group is doing better than the other? That right. questioning usually gets put at the usually gets weaponized against black people to be yeah. able to almost have confirmation bias. Hey, listen, man, black people was done wrong by white folks. Asian folks was done wrong by white folks. Asian people was locked out of business. Black people were locked out of business. Right. Somehow, you black people, y'all still ain't doing nothing. 
So I right. think that this example right here shows that we shouldn't blame this on white people because the Asians are not white people. They're doing better right now. This is obviously a black problem. I understand how, as a black person, how my community internalized that. You feel me? And mm -hmm. how we internalized that in a way where then we become rational. We start to rationalize for anti-blackness being able to be like, you know what? I'm not like, I'm not like the black people over there. You know how I can prove it? Mm -hmm. Because I can do this, that, and the other. And it's like, ah, we got we got we gotta do that. And that's the reason why this, I think this conversation is important, is acknowledging how upward mobility operates and acknowledging mm -hmm. how upward mobility is always operating on a nuance for different people based off their position. Right, right. Yeah. And something that I've been trying to explain to Asian Americans too is if you don't recognize that obstacles for us were removed, then what are you saying about Chinese laborers who were here in the United States before? That they built the entire railroad, but they were lazy and they didn't work hard and they didn't have proper motivation. And that's why that's why they weren't doing better than being railroad laborers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were, of course, working plenty hard, but they weren't at that time. You know, they weren't allowed to own businesses. There was a period of time where they couldn't buy homes. Um, I think that was something that I mentioned um, that in the 1940s. Uh, a lot of the Asian American business owners were living in the back of their store and people never knew that the reason why was during that period of time, Chinese and Japanese weren't allowed to buy residences. The biggest thing that I wish, again, it goes to the root cause harm in white supremacy. And something that I've always felt as an Asian American is if we understand how inaccurate stereotypes are about us and how we get portrayed in media and how we get talked about in media and in politics, we have to be able to understand that it's the same for other groups. Like that is like, if we recognize what's, what's being told that's inaccurate about us, then why are we not able to recognize that what's being said about black people is inaccurate or for all people of color? Like, yeah. and I think that goes to what you're saying is that we're all like, we're all indoctrinated to view one another through a white supremacist lens. So I think that's, that's what I want Asian Americans to recognize. We know, you know, if we know how it hurts us, then we should be able to recognize how it hurts others. Yeah. So, uh... Black people specifically, but all people of color watching this video mm -hmm. is being able to see our reality through a nuance lens and acknowledge mm -hmm. hey, as a black person, I shouldn't take on the ways that white people have told me to view Asian people. I shouldn't take on the way that mainstream has mm -hmm. taught me to take on political, social, economic ideas about Asian people. I should mm -hmm. also think about as well, me not internalizing black mm -hmm. inferiority in a way, but mm -hmm. I believe reason why I haven't experienced the upper mobility that my Asian brothers, sisters, non-gender people experiencing is because I'm poor, because I'm lazy, because I'm deficient. You see what I'm saying? Acknowledging there's an empowerment piece for Black people in this. Recognize, right. hey, the reason why you're going through the shit you're going through is not because something wrong with you. It's mm -hmm. not because your grandma, your great-grandma didn't have no hustle. It wasn't because they ain't have no grit, no grind. It wasn't because they ain't have no business acumen. We can recognize there were policies made by people for particular reasons to particular people for particular reasons. So we talk yeah. about leveling the playing field and then things like affirmative action get framed as like lifting, like as lifting one up, but it's like, we're not, we're not even talking about lifting anybody up. We're talking about having to fill in a gigantic hole that was dug yes. and that the United States was founded upon. So. This video was made to speak truth to power when it comes to how businesses operate within the black community. Don't nothing say divide and conquer more when you think about how Asian people were denied opportunities to make money in the white communities and corralled into the black communities to get little to no opportunity to be able to explore black people. When you think about what happened in 1992, literally 13 days after Rodney King get beat up by law enforcement, we view Latasha Harlins, you feel me? You see a young black teenage girl get unlocked for a card of orange juice. What I know with understanding Afro-pessimism and anti-blackness is that the idea of social death being pushed on to black bodies is one that the world is able to buy into. We know that whether you are Jewish, Asian, Italian, or American, it is something pervasive about anti-blackness. We know that in this video, we'll have more in this series to being able to get at how specific communities have been able to take advantage of anti-Black structures to build mobility at, at the expense of Black people or being able to build wealth on the backs of Black people.
Education is elevation. Stay constantly educated. Shirts available on the website.